because we're in the we're in the Gospel of Luke. So my uh, my last name Shank, right? Uh, if any of you guys have seen it spelled, I grew up in well, actually this would be Southern California, and then moved up to Northern California. Nobody in California knew how to pronounce my last name. It's got the German spelling S C H. And like I would, I played sports, and so you know you'd get your name called all the time, and I would just listen for my first name and some sort of gobbledygook, and then I knew that was my turn to go out on the wrestling mat or whatever it was they were calling me to. And I never really thought much about that. I mean, I kind of knew a little bit of my family history. My dad didn't really know his dad. That's where the name comes from. That was about it. And then I moved to Buffalo in you know my late twenties. And I, I, everybody would say, oh, are you related to so-and-so? Are you related to so There's like street names that are my last name. It's like, oh, wow, okay. Uh, all of a sudden, I guess I'm around my people or something. I don't really know what's going on. So, so I asked my, my dad for more family history. So really, I, I didn't know much of this until, until moving out here. And uh, yeah, so, my, uh, so this is the story that I now tell, tell people when they ask me, oh, are you related to so-and-so? I'm like, well... So my uh, dad's last name is Shank. His dad, whose last name is, his, his name is Albert Shank, at um, the age of 12, hopped on a train somewhere in central New York and got off uh, in Detroit and met a 16-year-old waitress, uh, begged her for food. She felt sorry for him, brought him home. Nine months later, my father was born. <laughs> Grandpa Albert had already run away. This is 13-year-old Grandpa Albert now. 16-year-old Grandma uh, has now my father, who then moves in with his grandparents. So my dad was raised by his grandparents, who were Italian immigrants. So my dad was raised in an Italian-speaking home. He learned English when he went to school for the first time, you know, at the age of five. And I share all of that to point at, at something that happened to my dad. Uh, he was five years old living with Grandma and Grandpa Serafini. His last name is Shank. And his, uh, so this is really, for all intents and purposes, his mom and dad, even though he uh, has a different last name than them. And his grandpa, his father, a father figure, asked him, hey, I think you should change your last name from Shank to Serafini. I only have daughters. You're, you're going to carry on the family name. And my dad said to his grandpa, no, I'm a Shank. I'm not a Serafini. And within that year, his grandpa died, which is obviously very traumatic for my dad. And um, then his mom and her new husband ended up coming and getting him and, and ultimately raising him. And he thought about that moment really for the rest of his life and regretted not changing his name from Shank to Serafini. But as like this young boy, no, I'm a Shank, I'm not a Serafini. Um, but regretted that for years. So this is like seven, eight years ago now. My dad called everybody in the family and said, what do you guys think about changing her name to Seraphine? Right? <laughs> we're, we're like, well, I don't know. If you really want to, Dad, I guess. So then he started researching it and realized how big of a pain in the neck it would be. So that never actually happened. Um, but I share, So I share that story. That's, that, that's actually several stories all kind of tied together. But I share that story with you because today we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture in Luke where genealogy is a big part of the story, but really it's a, it's a story um, or it's a passage of Scripture. It's actually kind of three different chunks of Scripture all put together where the identity of John the Baptist is questioned, but even more the identity of Jesus is put front and center, right? And some of that is tied to genealogy and family name, but also obviously when we're talking about Jesus and John the Baptist, we're talking about something more than just, you know, where does your name come from? So we're in, we're going to, uh, to read uh, Luke chapter 3, uh, and I'm trying to remember exactly where we left off, but I'll tell you when we get there. So if you want to turn with me to Luke chapter 3, and right, verse 15. So we're going to read verse 15 through the end. You guys are going to have to suffer through the, one of the, um, the begats of the New Testament, right? I've, I've suffered through it many times this week, so you guys can handle it once. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Uh, Luke 13, and I'm reading out of the New International Version. Luke, uh, Luke 3, verse 15. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come with the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all of the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Now, Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathet, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jani, the son of Joseph, the son of Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Esli, the son of Nagai, the son of Math, the son of Matthias, the son of Semyon, the son of Josek, the son of Jodah the son of Jonan, the son of Ressa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kosum, the son of Amaldim, the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of Eliezer, the son of Joram, the son of Mathet, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Eliakim, the son of Malia, the son of Mena, the son of Matatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Nashon, the son of Aminadab, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Sereg, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Kenan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Do we survive? <laughs> Is that all right? And just for the record, I'm sure I butchered most of those names. That's the key to biblical names, is you just pronounce with confidence, and everybody thinks you know what you're talking about. Um, so, man, there's a lot here, and there's some things that we're really not going to be able to dig into, so we're not going to touch Herod imprisoning John, like there's some stuff we're just going to have to skip over because there's a lot here. Um, but I want to start just by point. So we, 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 last week we looked at John, who is um, coming as this prophet from the wilderness, um, in many ways representing actually God as the true uh, high priest, right, who is preaching a baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins and has a really strong, stern message, but one that's being received by people, right? Uh, and so... People are responding to the clear authority that John has, and they're wondering, is this the Messiah, right? And so this question of John's identity is, is, is asked, and John responds by clearly saying, no, 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 I'm not, like, I know I'm bringing the ring to the wedding, but I'm not the groom, Right? I'm, I'm, I'm the one bringing the ring to the wedding, but somebody else is going to put it on your finger and they're going to speak the promises and they're going to be the one that fulfills those promises. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not the person to sell the, pro I'm the lawyer, I'm bringing the contract, but somebody else is going to sign it and they're going to fulfill it, right? This is what John is saying. Y yeah, I've got a role to play here, but somebody else is coming and they're the important person, right? The person you're waiting for is not me. And so John, even though John is someone of clear influence, is very clearly uh, claiming that, the, that what he is doing is pointing at the person of Jesus and that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. And I think that's actually really cool. We're going to dig into that idea a little bit more, that um, when John is questioned about who he is, he can't answer without talking about who Jesus is. When John is doing the work that he is called to do with his life, 
it can't help but make people ask questions about who he is that make him point at Jesus, right? That's pretty cool. And I think that's a model for us in many ways, as much as we are people who are to take on the identity of Jesus in our lives, as much as we are people to take on the purpose of Jesus in our lives. In many ways, I think John is this type for us, this template for what it means to be followers of Jesus, where, you know, when somebody says, Gail, who are you? You can't help but answer that question by pointing at who Jesus is when, you know, Nora, you're doing the things you feel called to do with your life. People are going to ask you, why are you, why are you doing this? And you can't help but point at the work of God and God's kingdom and how what you're doing fits into that, right? And I think that that really is what it means for us to be followers of Jesus is that our identity and purpose is so wrapped up in who Jesus is and, and what God is doing in our, in our world that when, when people want to know our story, well, that's just part of our story, when people are noticing our work. And, and again, John's work was, you couldn't ignore what John was doing. Even though it was out in the middle of nowhere, you couldn't ignore what John was doing, right? And so, again, I think there's something there for us to chew on. Uh, but John is pointing at the identity of Jesus, and John is pointing at the work of Jesus, right? That Jesus is the one who is coming. So, so John is offering this water baptism, right? I'm going to wash the dirt off of your body as a sign of something much bigger, a sign of repentance, which is on the inside, and forgiveness, which is this spiritual reality between God and his people, right? And so, yeah, we're going to have a bath, but it's a sign of something more. And the something more is what Jesus is bringing, this baptism with the Holy Spirit and with fire, Right? And he talks about this winnowing fork that Jesus has in his hand, right? And a winnowing fork is, um, you know, it's something you use after, after the harvest. You've got uh, a grain, whether it's rice or, or, you know, there's different kinds of things that you, you might harvest where you've got the grain, that's the heavy part, and then the chaff, which is like the part of the plant that you don't want, that you don't want to eat, but it's lighter. So you toss it up in the air, and the wind blows away the chaff, and the grain falls to the ground, and you can collect it, right? And that's this picture of what Jesus is coming to do. He's coming to baptize you truly, not as a symbol, but as a reality, into the very person of God himself, immersed in that. And there is this real um, division that Jesus is actually bringing, right, into people who want the life of the Spirit, who want to be with God and to be God's people and those who don't. And that, that choosing of people and sorting of people into, yeah, I want, I want my life to be for God. And actually, no, I've got other things I want my life to be for is something that Jesus is putting in front of his contemporaries, right? And as we read through the story, we realize that there are many people who, who might on the outside look as though they are God's people who turn out not to be God's people. And there are many people who look on the outside as though they might not be God's people who we, we begin to see, oh, wow, these are the very people that God claims as his own. But this is a part of the work that, that John is saying Jesus is coming to do. And so we see that Jesus is baptized, and there's a, there's a lot of uh, theological questioning that goes into the, this wrestling with wh why did Jesus get baptized for repentance of sins, right? And I, can't, I, can't, I forgot the name. Who was the, the quote? Card. Michael Card, right? This is a, and I'm, I, I don't know if I got an exact quote or if I'm quoting Gail quoting Michael Card, but uh, at the Jordan, Jesus undergoes a baptism of repentance for sins never committed, and on Golgotha, he will die as a punishment for sins never committed. Right? And is that a paraphrase? That's Michael Card. So that's not Gail <laughs> quoting Michael Card. That's, that's Michael Card. Anyway, so um, yeah, I think that that's, a, that's, that's probably a good place to leave it for this morning. If you guys like to geek out over things like that, I can point you towards some commentaries. But, but really what this is, is this is the moment that, you know, it's, it says uh, in, I think it's right, right at the end of the, the baptismal story that this is, Jesus is about 30 years old and this is the beginning of his public ministry, is him submitting to the baptism of John. Um, and, and it is, it's him participating in this rite as a part of, I think, his identification with us as people. 
But there's also something really powerful and special that happens. And it's kind of interesting reading through, you know, you, I'm, you, I'm sure you guys are aware, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell the story of Jesus. They tell it in slightly different ways. Um, there, there might be in John's account of, um, of Jesus' baptism, there's some hint that maybe God's voice from the heavens was audible to the people around him, right? It seems like maybe John the Baptist heard this voice, but clearly you can read from, from the, this text and the other gospels, God isn't speaking to anybody but Jesus, right? His words are directed to Jesus. Uh, I think there's something really powerful about that, that, that Jesus is baptized, the Holy Spirit de- descends on him in a powerful way, heaven is open, and God speaks to him, you are my son, I love you, I am pleased with you. And this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, the beginning of his work. And again, this is work that certainly has lots of joy and lots of, uh, I think Jesus probably enjoyed a lot of what he was doing, but a ton of hardship and a ton of adversity. And so for that to begin with this deep affirmation from his father of who he is and his love for him, I think is really important. So next slide. Um, Yeah, we're talking about uh, (laughs) identity and genealogy. This is, so, um, that's my great-grandpa. Can you you guys know, do you guys know which one it is? Can you tell? (laughs) You said this side. Anybody say the other side? (laughs) One says that side. We got three or four this way, one that way. So this is my great-grandpa. Yeah, the guy on, what's that? It's the chin? Yeah. So, um, man. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, 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 there's some pictures that I wish I had for this slideshow that I couldn't get my hands on. Um, there's one of my great grandma standing, she's like 70, 80 years old standing. She, this is on the front page of the, like some, one of the Detroit newspapers, standing on her front porch, shaking her fist at the newspaper guy with an eye patch. It's amazing. I couldn't find that one. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, I, I was realizing I got to get my hands on a, a print of that picture. Anyway, um, so this is my great grandpa, and um, so my, I never met him, but my gran- grandfather Jim, my mom's dad's. This is my mom's dad's dad, and um, yeah, all I really know about him is Grandpa Jim said he was mean, <laughs> and uh, they were sharecroppers. Right? That's um, that's a part of of my family story. Yeah, you guys can suffer through another Shank family, family story. This, is, this would be Cypert. So, so Grandpa Jim uh, was, I don't know, like six years old. They were a very devout Nazarene family. And um, his mom caught him saying his prayers at bedtime one night, and he was asking God to bless the poor sharecroppers. And she's like, why are, you, why are you praying for that? Well, I heard in church they were praying for the poor sharecroppers. And she didn't have the heart to tell him that it was their family that the church was praying for. <laughs> And so he's at home, dear God, please, please take care of the poor sharecroppers. And he realized he was praying for himself. So that's like a part of our family, family history. Um, anyway, so, so we read through this genealogy, right? And obviously genealogies can be really boring. This one has some names in it that we recognize, though. And oftentimes genealogies in Scripture are for that reason. So there certainly are some of the places where those genealogies really are about like keeping a record, but oftentimes they're also about communicating something about the person or about God's intention or, and I think here in this, um, you know, Luke is very clearly trying to say some things about Jesus. Uh, So interestingly enough, there's 77 names, 11 groups of seven, which is, you know, there's kind of like that number of perfection that there's some symbolism connected to that. Again, you can dig more into that if you're the nerdy type. Um, But some of the names in here. So first of all, this says it's the genealogy of Jesus through Joseph, his adopted father, right? And a lot of scholars would say that they actually think this is the genealogy of Mary, not of Joseph. Again, there's there's nerdy theological arguments about whether that's true or not, and I'm, I'm, I'm only a partial nerd, so I don't actually have my own opinion, but, but a lot of scholars would say that this is actually Jesus' genealogy through Mary. Um, but uh, you have some, some key figures, right? So David, Abraham, interestingly enough, this, this genealogy goes back beyond Abraham in many ways that's what a lot of the commentaries pointed at is the most significant thing about this so you've got Matthew's genealogy of Jesus that doesn't feel necessary to emphasize 
Jesus' common humanity, right? That Jesus traces his lineage back to, to Adam. That he certainly is the Jewish Messiah, but he's ultimately the king of the universe. He is the, the world's Messiah, right? And that's a part of what we've pointed out is these two great themes of Luke. One is that the story of Jesus is not just the story of Jesus. It's the story of God's work throughout all of history, redeeming all people and all things to himself, right? It's the Luke's gospel is tied to the much larger story of scripture and of God's work redeeming people. But also Luke emphasizes the way that this isn't just for those people that we might think of as insiders. It's not just for religious people. It's not just for you know, the successful people or the pretty people. It's not just for the Jewish people. It's for all people. In fact, it's oftentimes, according to Luke's gospel, the very people that we think don't belong, don't fit in, aren't God's chosen, that Jesus makes clear, yep, these are the chosen ones. These are the ones that God is reaching out to. These are the ones that God is saving. These are the ones that God's gospel is coming for. And so really, I think that's a big part of what is being highlighted through this genealogy. Pizza for everybody? Is that the rule? <laughs> Joking. I was, I was, after I said it, I was like, wait, it's not my phone, is it? But mine's up here. So, all right. Um, okay, so we've looked through this, this text. And um, again, there's so much more that we could... Oh, you want to grab that? Just turn it off? Yeah, you could do that. If you leave your phone in the sanctuary going off, I think you give somebody else the right to go through your bag. Is that fair? (laughs) And you're my daughter, so I can ask you to do it. All right, there we go. Cool. We we won't tell Shelly Ann. We'll see if she watches it later. All right. um, So we've gone through this, this passage and looked at some things. Again, there's a lot more work that we could do with it. But I think the, the, the two big things that I want to take out of this are the, these questions of identity and purpose, right? And so that's both Jesus' identity and Jesus' purpose, John's identity and John's purpose, and our own identity and our purpose, right? Um, you can throw the next slide up. Yeah, see if you guys, rec- oh, that's not a good one. Next slide. Hmm, next one? No, that's a bummer. All right, well, you guys, you can leave that one up there. That's fine. Uh, Somehow the picture didn't show up. We had this happen like twice before now. I don't know, weird. We'll figure it out. There was a picture of my dad up there, only you wouldn't have known it's my dad because it's an old picture. It's from his 16th birthday. He's with a group of friends. I was going to do the same thing. Yeah, it's a good picture. Uh, I was going to ask you if you could pick, pick out the one I'm related to. Anyway, so um, but this, so this is, uh, yeah, this is the six-year-old boy that was praying for the poor sharecroppers only to find out 15 years later that he was the poor sharecropper, right? So that's, that's Grandpa Jim, Grandma Dorothy, and that is baby Zoe. Um, yes. So, <laughs> so the, the question of identity. So first of all, Jesus' identity is made clear in this passage, that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the king. He's the anointed, right? We know that that word Messiah is, uh, the, or the word Christ, right? Oftentimes we, we think of the word Christ as Jesus' name. It's not his name. It's a title. It's the, the Jewish, or the, the Greek word that matches the Jewish word Messiah. They both mean the same thing, which is the anointed one, right? And that, that was the title of the Jewish king, the anointed one. And that was the symbol of both the, the literal anointing oil that was poured on the king as a sign of their, their um, kind of ascendance to the throne, but also was symbolic of the Holy Spirit descending upon this person as God's chosen one, right? But Jesus is uniquely the Messiah in the sense that he is this long-awaited king in the, the, the prophesied king in the line of David that the Jewish people have been waiting for for centuries. And there's all sorts of people who will come along and claim to be king, claim to be Messiah, uh, that clearly are not. But here we're seeing John saying, you know, to the crowds who are wondering, John, are you the Messiah? No, 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 no. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the king. He's the one that we've been waiting for. And, but also, as we see in this, in this passage, Jesus' identity as king is made clear, but so is his identity as God's son, right? as the son of God, as God uh, come to be with us. And as Maybe as Christians, we don't think about how, how profound 
of a claim that is. And I think in many ways it's a good thing that we're so accustomed to thinking about God coming to visit us through the, the person of Jesus that we, we sometimes miss out on how important it is that not only is Jesus God coming to visit us and that Jesus' identity is as the Son of God, as fully God, as fully, full, full deity, but also that Jesus is fully human, right? And that, that, that is just as much uh, an important part of who Jesus' identity is, uh, of who he is, that, and, and again, I think sometimes we lose sight of that side of things because we're just kind of used to it as Christians. Um, and I mean, for the record, throughout church history, the church has had to deal with heresies on both sides. People who have said, no, 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 there's no way Jesus was God. He was just a really good man. Clearly, we've heard those kinds of things. But also throughout church history, the church has had to deal with people saying, there's no way that Jesus could have been human. He was something else entirely. And the church has always rejected that and said, no, Jesus is both fully God and fully human. And that's, you know, scripture talks over and over again about Jesus being the high priest, right? And stepping into this high priestly role in this unique way. And what the, so the high priest was the one who represented God to the people, right? The priest steps into that place, but also the high priest was the one who represented the people to God. And so that is exactly what Jesus does in a way that no other high priest could actually do, right? And we see that in several places in Scripture, this, this pointing at Jesus' unique identity as what makes it possible for him to ultimately bridge the gap between us and God because of who he is. And so we have this, this like clear picture and statement of who Jesus is that's also tied to his purpose, right? John points at Jesus as the Messiah, uh, as Jesus is the Son of God, as Jesus as the descendant of Adam. But also we have the, the pointing at Jesus as the one who is bringing the forgiveness that this baptismal repentance is pointing towards, right? He's the one who's doing that. And so we have the purpose of Jesus. We have the work that Jesus has done and, uh, or, or is coming to do. But tied to that is the cost, the cost of what Jesus brings, right? Jesus is the one who brings salvation, but it's at, at an incredible cost. And I think that, I guess that points at how important it is that Jesus' public ministry begins with this deep affirmation from God with the, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on him. Because what Jesus is coming to do and what he's coming to offer is glorious. It's wondrous. It's amazing. But it's also going to cost Jesus everything that he has. And for us, you know, there's a, there's a type for that in us, right? We are also invited to be a part of doing something with our lives that really is glorious and wondrous, probably not on the same scale as, as Jesus or even John the Baptist, but we're invited to be a, a part of doing something with our lives. All of you have something that God has put you here on the earth to offer that really is life-giving, is beautiful. It's, you know, it aligns with the way that God made you. We, we all are invited to serve God in some way, shape, or form, but it's also going to cost us right? And, you know, maybe you're looking forward to a life of service and you're excited about it. Like, be open-eyed about the fact that there will be costs involved for some, some of us in the room that have gone down that path a little bit. It's like, oh yeah, I got some scars, right? But also, I've got some glory stories and it's worth the scars. But this is, this is where it, <laughs> I was thinking about, I, I know a couple, I, this is not my approach and this was not the approach that my pastor took with me, but I know several pastors who whenever somebody comes to them and says, I think I'm called to be a pastor, they just say, no, you're not. That's what they tell everybody. I'm called to be a pastor. No, you're not. And then uh, if the person comes back a second time and says, I think you're wrong, I am called to be a pastor, they'll say, yeah, I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's kind of crazy. Again, not my approach, not the approach that was taken with me, but I know some people that, like people in ministry, that that's the way they handle it. Um, think, take, take that and figure out what you think about it. But the, the point in that is the, 
it's so incredibly important. And, I, and this is not unique to pastoring. Part of the reason why I put this picture of my grandma and grandpa on screen is that, um, so my grandmother was a, a homemaker, stay-at-home mom, and my grandpa was a construction worker. He built houses, right? And these are two of the godliest people I've ever met in my life who exuded Jesus. They really were people whose lives were spent for the kingdom, right? Not pastors, not missionaries, not worship leaders, not youth pastors, none of that. Um, and yet, you know, both of them, I, I, their funerals, I got to do my grandmother's funeral, um, <laughs> just like hundreds of people came from their church to their funeral to just talk about the impact that they had on their lives, right? So these were people who had spent their lives for Jesus and for his kingdom as a homemaker and as a, a home builder, right? And so this isn't just about being a pastor or anything like that, but it is about being people who, you know, like John, we can't answer the question, Steve, who are you, without talking about who Jesus is. And the work that we do with our lives is something that makes people ask questions about who we are and who God is. Right? And that's, that is something for all, and that's, that's, that's a big, that's a heavy thing to, to lay on somebody, right? <laughs> that you're supposed to do work with your life that causes people to ask questions about God. And yet I would say I think that is actually what all of us are called to do. But again, you can do that as a stay-at-home mother and a construction worker. Absolutely. So the question is for you, what, what does that look like for you, right? What has God called you to do and be with your life? And many of you guys know the answer to that. Some of you don't, and that's okay to not know the answer. But to put that in, in front of us as a church and say, this is what it means to be Christians, to be people who follow Jesus. Is that all right? Can I do that? So if that's a heavy thing to lay on you this morning, um, A, seek out family, <laughs> right? Like find people to wrestle with and, and be okay with the process. I mean, for me personally, this was, well, if you go back to birth, this was like a 20 plus year process, right? Um, of me not even asking the question, but really from the time I began to follow Jesus until the time where I felt like I had a clear sense of my purpose in, in Christ was, I don't know, seven, eight years, right? That's fine. So it's okay to be in that place of not having a clear sense of calling on our lives. But also God has that for you. So lean into that. But also something, the, the last thing that I want to share um, is just pointing back at this scene where Jesus goes into the water with John and is baptized and the Holy Spirit falls in him and the heavens open and God says to Jesus, you're my son. I love you. I've got a plan for your life. And I'm proud of the, the person that you are and what you're about to go do. And this comes before the work. It comes before the sacrifice. It comes before the glory. Right? And I think there's something really powerful about that. You can put the next slide up. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I picked on you this morning, kid. So that having that, um, you know, and... For all of us, we, we all had parents. Some of us had horrible parents. Some of us had great parents. Some of us had parents that said to us, you can do great things because I'm behind you and I love you and I'm for you. And some of us had parents in our lives who tore us down and ripped us to shreds, right? So we've like, but also we all have had people in our lives who stood behind us and affirmed us, right? We know what that feels like. And, and so for Jesus to have God his father, speak those words to him before entering into the sacrifice of ministry and the glory of ministry. I think it, it points to what we need too, right? We, we, and <laughs> this is what God does. He chooses us before we're worthy of being chosen and then makes us worthy, right? That's what the gospel is. He chooses us when we don't think we deserve it because he's good he does it anyway, and then he makes us into the kind of people that are worthy of being chosen by God. That's the gospel. That's what he does. That's how God works, right? And so, uh, yeah, I had asked at our, at our um, staff meeting this week, just anybody got any stories about stuff like this? And Gail had shared one, and Zach had shared one, and um, yeah, just about your graduation from Fuller, right, and having your dad show up 
And uh, I know, I, I don't know if I'll make her cry now, but you were like tearing up in the room, right? But having your dad show up and gather everybody around, all your friends and classmates, and, and just take, not to say anything deep and profoundly wise, but to just say, this is my daughter. You guys are her friends. We're really proud of her, and we're grateful for who she is and what she's accomplished. Thank you guys for being a part of her life and for being here to celebrate this with us. I don't know if I got the words right, but I got the sentiment, right? And, like, how many years ago was that? Yeah, I forgot. <laughs> that was awesome. It was, like, four or five years ago. <laughs> but it's still, it's like a powerful moment, right? And it's powerful for us because we know Gail, but it's also powerful for us because we know fathers and daughters, right? It's like, man, that's... That's a powerful moment, and I had asked, Zach had shared, this one wasn't about a, a story with his father, but a, a story with a mentor, uh, another worship leader that Zach had served under, who was also like a, uh, somebody who was in, you guys were in like a discipleship relationship where he was pouring into you, and just that he had affirmed you in your call, uh, calling, right, and it said to you, hey, like, if this is what God is calling you to do, nothing can stand in your way. You can do this, right? And to have somebody who knows you, who's heard you confess your junk, who's watched you succeed, watched you fail, knows your strengths and your weaknesses, say, God has called you to do this thing, and you can do it, and I believe in you, right? And to have somebody say that to you, and you, you, you shared how, like, Ted saying that to you has been something you've revisited time and time again over your life. And I would point at, you know, there are more than one of those moments, but for me, uh, I shared last week that that Isaiah passage that's really meaningful for me, uh, where you know God says, "Can a nursing mother forget her own baby while she's nursing it?" Yeah, probably not. Even more so with me, I will never forget you. I've carved your name in the palms of my hands. I'll never forget you, right? And that that verse actually um, came. The, this guy, Gus, tattoo artist, all covered in tattoos, was a part of our church for like three months or something crazy like that. Um, barely knew him. He like showed up at our church, I think just to like give me this word in prophecy and leave, right? But this came at this moment where I was just really struggling. You know, I'd lived a lot of years out in the world and not following Jesus, doing a lot of crazy, stupid stuff, stuff that I was ashamed of, and was coming back into the church and into relationship with Jesus and was wrestling with a ton of shame uh, and a ton of, um, yeah, just like voices in my head accusing me all the time. But also I really was falling in love with Jesus and wanting to be in his presence and was just struggling with that. And... Um, Several people, I had several moments like this, but this moment with Gus where he pulled me aside, I've got, I've got a word for you from the Lord, and I'm immediately afraid, because anytime that happens, it's like, oh dear God, like I'm about to get my, 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 my dirty laundry is about to get aired, is kind of the way I felt about that. Um, and this was one of those moments that really shifted the way that I saw God, but also the way that I saw myself, you know. I've got a word from the Lord for you. Oh, no, he's a, like, he told you all of the stuff I did, didn't he? <laughs> he's told you everything. No, please don't tell anybody about who I am. And he read that verse to me and said, God loves you. Like, this is what he says about you. And, you know, I'm sobbing. He's praying for me. And it was this moment of, of change in who I am and, again, who I saw God to be for sure, but I think even more who I saw myself to be because God is saying to me, really, Steve, I don't see you as just the sum total of your past actions and past decisions. Yeah, sure, that's part of it, but really who I see you to be is who you are going to be as the person that I love and the person that I am choosing, and if you will respond to me, this is who you are, right? This is, and I, I love you. And so there's this, like, that's what's happening with Jesus. But that also is the, what the gospel is for all of us, is God saying, I love you. I'm your father. I choose you. I'm proud of you. Let's go and do life together. Let's step into this thing, right? So um, that's a good place to take communion, yeah? That uh, um, just invitation to receive God's love, which is really what communion is pointing at, is the, the sacrifice of Jesus 
that was made on our behalf so that we can receive God's affirmation, God's love, God's life, that we can be immersed into that. And it's, you know, bound up in this symbolic meal that is both a representation of Jesus' broken body and shed blood, but also this symbolic representation of God's life being made available to us to be sustenance for us. So, um, yeah, I don't know if there's something that God is putting his finger on this morning uh, in you, um, something you're chewing on or wrestling with or ashamed of or excited about um, or just something you're remembering or something you're dreaming about that you feel like is significant, I would invite you to be talking to God about that during this time as we're taking communion together.